So I just want to say a quick a word of welcome to everybody who's uh, joined us for this webinar today on uh, palliative care and the management of dyspnea. And I want to say a special thanks to our presenters, Amanda Bercher. Amanda is a um, nurse practitioner with the Regional Palliative Care Consultation Team, um, four days of the week. And then that other day, she's the uh, one of the clinical co-leads for um, Palliative Care for Ontario Health East. And then Jessica joins us. She's a physician who works with uh, the uh, Regional Palliative Care Consultation Team. And then she also does work um, on the Palliative Care Unit, uh, supporting uh, patients and families there. So um, without further ado, I just want to remind participants that we are recording so that when we get to the point of asking questions, just to be sure not to put any sort of confidential patient information um, in, your, in your questions or your stories. Okay, so without further ado, over to you, Amanda and Jessica. Great. Thanks, Val. And thanks, everyone, for making time in their busy days to attend today. Um, I think we're going to try and keep it a little bit less formal and try to make sure that we have some time at the end for questions. So certainly as we go through the presentation, um, I'll kind of be doing the first half, Dr. Roy will be doing the second half, and at any point, you know, we're very comfortable to jump in and add to things. So you will be hearing from both of us as we as we go through this presentation. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to give everyone a chance to put any burning questions or clinical scenarios into the chat uh, that they want to make sure we we cover today as we discuss the topic of dyspnea. We're hoping by the end of this presentation that you will all be able to recognize signs of dyspnea, anticipate which patients might be at highest risk of the symptom, and then understand some of the treatments and therapies available for people. So I'm going to start with a poll. Maybe you can use the raise hand feature, but a show of hands, who looks at this gentleman and thinks, oh, he's dyspneic? So it looks like some people have put up their hands. Some people are maybe not sure. So we're going to come back to this picture, but certainly when we look at him, we might wonder, is he experiencing dyspnea? So I just want to go back to some of the philosophy behind palliative care and how things are changing and where things are going. So the old approach to palliative care was that patients would undergo their curative treatments. They would eventually reach a point where treatment was no longer able to correct the underlying disease. Their treatment would stop and they would be deemed palliative, which is a term I don't really support using anymore. And then there would be a short period of time where they had palliative care leading to their death. Now palli palliative care is more uh, being involved sooner and sort of coming in and out, weaving within the thread of the patient's care disease with our in level of involvement progressively increasing over time and recognition that there needs to be some support after the death. So how do you know in patients with a non-cancer diagnosis or even with a cancer diagnosis, whether a palliative care approach would be appropriate? And um, one way of determining whether it might be appropriate is to ask yourself the surprise question. Would I be surprised if this patient died within the next six months, one year? And if your answer is no, it wouldn't surprise me, then they probably could benefit from a palliative approach to care. Does that mean that they need a specialist level palliative consultant and Dr. Jessica Roy needs to come in and see that patient? No, it just means that it's maybe time to give some thought to some goals of care discussion, maybe starting to open some doors and think a, a little bit outside of the traditional disease management course. So there was a framework developed, I want to say in 2010, out of the UK, and it's called the Gold Standards Framework. And they really looked at patient factors and disease factors for the different conditions around when a palliative approach should be considered. So if a patient has uh, two or more of these general indicators of decline, it, they could benefit from a palliative approach. Now in the retirement home long-term care sector, the ones that are easy for nurses to pick up on is that increased need for support. So somebody's starting to need some help with their activities of daily living, or maybe they're needing um, a worker to come bring them down to the dining room for their meals. That's a sign that things have really changed for that patient. 
along with weight loss of 10% of their sort of healthy body weight. Uh, even in non-cancer diagnosis, we see these kind of progressive, unintentional weight loss as we get closer to the end of life. And then repeated recurrent admissions. So if they're going to hospital over and over again with an exacerbation of their COPD or their congestive heart failure, again, these are triggers that it might be time to um, initiate a palliative approach to care. For COPD, there's some COPD-specific uh, disease indicators. So an FEV1, which is a lung metric of, of their functional vital capacity, if it's less than 30%. Again, recurrent uh, hospital admissions, patients on long-term oxygen. And then if there's any associated heart failure, that would be another good reason uh, to think about a palliative approach. For congestive heart failure, same principles, going back and forth to the hospital over and over again that surprise question. And then if we're really struggling to balance, sometimes we reach a point in congestive heart failure patients where we're struggling to balance their fluid volume and their blood pressure, and we're wanting more Lasix, but they're hypotensive and they're maybe falling. These are all signs that their disease is getting more difficult to manage and that it's probably time for a palliative approach to care. I would just add that this is a yeah. very easy Google, like if you put in like gold standard framework COPD, gold standard framework CHF, or just the gold standard framework, they have a really beautiful PDF that has like all the diseases in um, these like beautiful little bubbles with all the criteria. So there's a neurological one. Um, and that's not like in the premise of this talk, but um, it's something that I use a lot in my consult notes where I say like, you know, this, this patient is appropriate for a palliative lens to care because of they've meeting two criteria from the gold standard framework. So um, yeah, never be afraid to refer to us if you're not sure, but th this would definitely, if they do meet those criteria, that would be something that if you do want to another opinion on things that this would be appropriate for our RBCT. Good. So why dyspnea? Why have a whole hour talk on dyspnea? Why is it important? So it's actually an incredibly prevalent symptom in the palliative care spectrum, particularly in cancer. 90% of patients with lung cancer will experience dyspnea, but 50 to 70% of patients with any type of cancer will um, experience dyspnea. Again, with non-cancer uh, diseases like COPD, congestive heart failure, you might see dyspnea quite often as well as some neurological conditions like MS or ALS, you might also see patients with dyspnea. And then th there's the concept of dyspnea versus work of breathing. So dyspnea is a subjective experience. It's the patient's reported level of breathlessness. And it's not necessarily proportional to their oxygen saturations as we advance in their disease. It's also not necessarily proportional to their effort or their work of breathing. So work of breathing is more the, the objective signs that we see that there might potentially be dyspnea, but there's not necessarily dyspnea. And that's where you might see someone sitting in that tripod position, really using their accessory muscles to pull those lungs open. They might be breathing quickly, have that prolonged expiration, and they might make some sounds when they're breathing, grunting or whistling through their mouth, et cetera. So again, coming back to our gentleman from the beginning, is this patient dyspneic? What do people think? We don't know, right? We gotta ask him, we gotta find out. He could be living with COPD, congestive heart failure, and this could be his normal. And he actually tells you, I'm quite okay. Or he could be not okay. He could say, actually, today's a bad day. I'm having a fair amount of dyspnea. So really important to be actively asking patients and not assuming. So when we look at causes of dyspnea, there's a lot of them and we won't take the time today to go through them all. But um, when we're going to start to develop a treatment plan, which Dr. Roy is gonna talk about later, we, we really have sort of three arms of our treatment plan. The first arm is going to be to treat the underlying cause or, or optimize the treatments for the underlying cause. So if you have a patient with COPD, you're going to see as in an acute exacerbation of the COPD, do they need their puffers ad um, adjusted, et cetera. We're not really gonna talk about that arm of treatment during this talk today. The second thing is to support and educate the patient. So are they taking their puffers correctly? Are they using their medications as prescribed? Do we need to look at home care? Do we need to tune up some of the supports? And then the third arm would be the management of the symptom. And that's what Dr. Roy is gonna talk about a lot more uh, later in this presentation. I see your, your hand is up, Jess. Did you wanna add something? 
maybe it just looks like it on my screen. Sorry about that, but it looks like you're okay. So when we talk about causes of dyspnea, there's sort of things that happen within the lungs to trigger dyspnea, things that happen outside of the lungs to trigger dyspnea. So we might have a disease process going on, whether it's their underlying lung disease or whether they might have an acute infection or perhaps an embolus. And then things outside of the lung might be something like heart failure. So if you remember, the heart and the lungs are very interconnected. And as the heart stops beating as efficiently or as effectively, you can have a backup or a buildup of fluid in the lungs that can trigger some symptoms of dyspnea. Could they have an arrhythmia? Could they be an AFib? Could they have uh, some issues with their vena cava? And again, a backup of blood flow, um, things to explore. Then we can look at things that are plural causes, like a pleural effusion. So those are common in patients, can be fairly common in certain cancers where there's actually a buildup of fluid in between the lining of the lung and it causes a lot of uh, distress. And there's medical interventions for that. You might have seen a pleurex catheter, which is where a catheter can be put into drain fluid. It can be left in and the nurses could be coming and draining small amounts of fluid regularly to help uh, increase the volume of the lung and reduce some of the breathlessness tumors and uh, pneumothorax, which would be more like air in the, in the spaces of the lung where it shouldn't be. Then when we think about extra thoracic causes, so outside of our lung cavity or our heart, uh, these things would be abdominal distension. So if you have somebody with liver disease and they're developing ascites and they're getting this big swollen abdomen and they look like they're eight months pregnant, that's pressing on the lungs and creating less space for the lungs to, to exchange oxygen and it's going to cause some dyspnea. There can be metabolic causes, especially in patients with um, things like diabetes or some uh, electrolyte disturbances may be caused by a particular disease. There could be tumor related changes, or we sometimes see changes in the regulation of the breathing with neurological conditions. They could be anemic, so their blood levels could be low. That makes them short of breath, and maybe they want to go for a transfusion to re resolve some of that shortness of breath. The big thing we see in patients closer to end of life, whoops, is uh, malnutrition or that cachexia syndrome. So they lose a lot of weight without trying. They're very, very skinny. They lose their muscle tone and the muscles that open and close the lungs have sort of wasted away. And you see patients who get really tired really easily and that makes them out of breath. And then anxiety and anxiety is an important consideration that we'll talk a lot about later because Dyspnea can drive anxiety, but anxiety it goes the other way too. Anxiety can drive dyspnea. And so sometimes when we're coming up with a management plan, we're looking to target the anxiety piece as well. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Roy, and she's going to talk about our approach to managing dyspnea. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, so I think Amanda alluded to kind of the first step is like, where do we think the dyspnea is coming from? Where is the shortness of breath coming from? And, you know, we can easily skip that step and use certain medications that we'll get into in a little bit, but we may be missing like the target. We may be able to reduce the side effects by targeting the actual problem. And sometimes we can't. And, you know, and, and um, I do have conversations with my patients and their families about that. Like we can't control the underlying disease. So we're going to move to step two, but at the same time, it's really good to keep a, an open mind and, and thinking through your differential diagnoses and, how I do that is, you know, asking questions around the the dyspnea and what what type of questions would be helpful, um, like what helps with the shortness of breath, what doesn't help, what makes it worse, um, and then any associated symptoms like cardiac, respiratory, um, and then doing a really good physical exam. And so um, I don't have the luxury of having tests at my fingertips um, working in the community. And because you guys are all um, through retirement homes, you're kind of the same. You have to think about like, how much do I need a test um, that I would want to send that patient out for? Can I do blood work here easily? Things like that. And so this slide is just to represent thinking through your differential and then trying to treat the, the actual cause of the dyspnea. So I gave a, a few examples, but there's a, 
a laundry list of them, but for CHF, you know, continuing proper heart failure um, preventative medications, if they're tolerating them, can really reduce the chance that they're going to have a CHF exacerbation. So often you'll see like, oh, this patient's palliative. Well, let's stop all their med oral medications. Or And sometimes we're missing the point of trying to prevent the symptom as opposed to um, kind of making life easier for them. It may be making life harder. Um, that being said, sometimes blood pressure is an issue. They can, we have to start titrating off these medications, but, you know, thinking through your quadruple therapy of prevention of um, heart failure uh, and keeping those med medications on board when you can. And that includes diuretics. So a lot of times in the past I've heard, well, why would we diurese the patient, their end of life? Like, you know, I don't want to have to try to monitor like input output um, and like Lasix or furosemide or diuretics in general are actually like one of our most powerful tools in treating dyspnea with congestive heart failure because it takes the fluid out of the lungs and so potentially can improve the shortness of breath. And so using that almost as kind of step one in your dyspnea management for CHF is important um, and not forgetting to continue them if, if possible, um, if tolerating. Um, another example, and I saw Val uh, posted in the chat that regarding the management of COPD. So, um, you know, COPD is probably one of our more common um, diseases that we see with a shortness of breath. And uh, a lot of times we forget to continue and um, optimize the inhaler use. And sometimes potentially, and my, my knowledge um, is becoming dwindling with all the new inhalers that are coming on the market. I haven't been in practice that long, um, but at the same time, like within the last eight years, I feel like the inhalers have changed again and again and again, but trying to keep up with your um, with the knowledge of which inhalers are helpful and using your inhalers um, to its maximum ability to stay on top of their COPD. Um, there is some evidence to say that, you know, continuing your long actings instead of leaning on the short actings all the time is important. And so if you're seeing a patient with more and more Ventolin or Salbutamol um, use, then trying to increase the long actings is important to try to prevent that, um, the short acting inhaler use. Um, and then having a plan potentially in regards to COPD exacerbation. So if a patient's having increased shortness of breath or change in their sputum um, quantity or consistency or color, one, two of those merit um, the diagnosis of a COPD exacerbation. And then having a plan with, you know, within your retirement home with the MRP of initiating potentially steroids or antibiotics um, in getting that under control to prevent any admissions and reduce symptom load. Um, just a quick word on steroids with COPD. So some of our patients, you know, we do like just pulse with COPD exacerbations, but there is some evidence to say that some patients can't tolerate um, being off the steroid. And then so as soon as they come down after their five days of uh, COPD exacerbation treatment, that they'll um, start having more symptoms. And so considering a taper in that in that time where you're keeping them on a high dose, but then very slowly trying to find the lowest possible dose that can keep their disease under control while tolerating um, the medication and its side effects. And I also included a word on prophylactic antibiotics. So some people who've had more than a few exacerbations um, within a year merit prophylactic antibiotics with certain medications. And so, you know, looking for advice from that from potentially a respirologist can be helpful, but also there's some guidelines where the use of a uh, macrolide um, kind of ongoing, um, like azithromycin or something like that, if three times a week can try to keep the exacerbations at bay. Um, and lastly, just a comment on dyspnea, as Amanda was alluding to, that potentially someone who has an anxiety disorder may have shortness of breath from their anxiety, and it may not be related to any lung disease, and potentially can be. It, it, anxiety can lead to dyspnea, but also dyspnea can lead to anxiety. And so if you do think that there is a primary component to an anxiety disorder that's leading to dyspnea, then trying to manage that with, you know, emotional support, with potentially counseling, um, leaning on your allied health with spiritual care, 
Um, and then considering pharmacological management in terms of like an SSRI or an SSN SNRI, depending on your population, um, and potentially using like benzodiazepines to manage their dyspnea if it does become uh, progressively increased. Um, you can go to the next slide, Amanda. So the next step would be to also consider um, goals of care in terms of treating acute complications that may be a little bit more invasive. And so um, talking to your patient, like if there is a risk potentially of um, like, let's say an anemia, like, would you consider a transfusion? Like, should we do blood work to see where your hemoglobin levels are? And would we even bother doing the testing if you're not going to go through with a transfusion? So exploring those ideas of the reversible causes and using um, like your framework for goals of care or potentially a serious illness conversation to talk about what is tolerable to them and at what expense are they willing um, to kind of have this dyspnea if they don't want to go through with potentially um, treatments that could reverse the dyspnea. Um, so another example would be an antibiotics for pneumonia or um, if potentially if there is like airway compromising, looking for radiation to be treating like a bronchogenic tumor. Um, and so then looking at kind of if we're looking at, OK, we've explored the differential, we've thought, OK, we treated maximally or we decided not to because it's not within the patient's goals. Then we're looking at, okay, we have this symptom. Now, how do we just target the symptom knowing that we're not going to be able to potentially fix or improve the situation of the underlying condition? And so there are like some non-pharmacological, uh, just to give you a kind of a framework of what we'll discuss, we'll discuss some non-pharmacological strategies, discuss oxygen um, and potentially titration orders, um, speaking about opioids as first line for treatment of dyspnea and benzodiazepines as second line. I have a little asterisk there just because to remind us that if there is like, if anxiety disorder is um, the leading cause of the dyspnea, then potentially that benzodiazepines may be a first, like further up the, the um, framework for management of the dyspnea rather than opioids. So some non-pharmacological strategies to manage dyspnea, um, a lot of them are, you know, trying to bring focus to the breath and how we can teach the patient to control their breathing. Um, there are some really good rehab uh, programs, pulmonary rehab programs that it's maybe hard to get into, but a lot of the strategies they teach there is mind mindful breathing. And so um, potentially using, there's lots of different strategies like box breathing or purse lip breathing, where you're encouraging patients to take a, a breath in and breathing out through like almost like purse lips or like a straw. Um, to kind of slow the breathing out or the expiration. Um, other is box breathing. So focusing on like breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out, just trying to trace the rectangle as you're doing it or arms up, arms down, any type of strategy that they can think more about their breathing um, and try to calm it down themselves. Um, positioning often is very helpful. So we'll see a lot of patients who are lying flat or lying just on a slight angle and sitting up can really help them with the breathlessness, um, even tripoding. So that's like our gentleman in this slide that we show at the beginning of the presentation where the hands are kind of on the knees, the patient's leaning forward. It kind of expands the chest as you're using your arms, um, but also to uh, lean forward can help sometimes with breathlessness. Um, and that in keeping with like congestive heart failure or potentially a pleural effusion, if there's fluid involved, the further up you sit, the water goes down with gravity, and then there's more room at the top ends of the lungs to have better breathing. Um, otherwise, like there's been some um, evidence to support using a fan at the time of breathlessness. And so um, the, the evidence says to mostly blow it from more of an angle to the face so that the, there is some uh, receptors in, in our cheeks that will pick up on the sensation of a breeze and will decrease the sensation of breathlessness as well. And so the, those strategies can sometimes just be enough for some patients. Um, we've definitely seen patients who, you know, calm down with the use of oxygen and um, when their oxygen saturations are normal. And that also can just be because of the mindfulness of thinking that the oxygen is going in um, and being more conscious of their breath. 
Um, can keep going. They're great. Um, I, I didn't really mention a lot about oxygen, didn't give it its own slide, but on the uh, previous slide, if you can skip back, Amanda, I'll just make a few comments on that. So um, home oxygen can be really helpful for um, people with um, dyspnea, and sometimes it's not necessarily that they won't get medically approved for it. Um, there is a funding program for palliative oxygen, and so um, just being mindful that the government will fund three months of home oxygen for patients at end of life, um, but once that uh, three months is up, then the patient either has to pay or hopefully they will medically qualify at that point. Um, and so generally I'll recommend if they're, they don't have COPD to keep the oxygen around 93%. Um, whereas if you do have COPD, you're kind of aiming for a lower value of like 88 to 90, 93 to keep the um, oxygen that level. Because if you get too much oxygen, there can be like a decreased respiratory drive and potentially some accumulation of carbon dioxide. I'd say that's more, um, like I don't see that very often, more anecdotally, but there is like some research to prove that. So moving along to opioids, um, uh, there definitely are, are like the, the biggest uh, medica medication class that we use to manage dyspnea in palliative care. Um, but we definitely get a lot of questions about them when we're prescribing it. And there's lots to in to that initial conversation, especially that you have to talk to patients and families about addressing their myth, the myths and obtaining their buy in to start opioids. Um, you know, the classic ones are, am I going to get addicted? Is this going to make me too sleepy? Um, you know, am I going to be able to drive? All these types of questions come up and it's good to like address them at the forefront so you're not having to deal with it later on. Um, and we can talk about that if you guys have any questions at the end of the presentation. I normally go over the pathophysiology of opioids in the sense I kind of big picture, as I say, it works in your brain to help reduce the feeling of shortness of breath, but it doesn't change the cause of, of where the shortness of breath is coming from. And so, you know, in keeping with, we're not going to manage your heart disease any differently, but your heart disease is causing you to have shortness of breath. We're going to just try to make you feel more comfortable. Um, Generally, when we start opioids, we would start at kind of a low dose, kind of regardless of the population. But if there is any element of congestive heart failure or renal failure, we would want to be even further reducing the dose um, and spreading out the frequency. And so kind of a starting dose typically with uh, a morphine, let's say, would be like five milligrams every hour for um, by mouth for dyspnea, PRN for dyspnea as needed for dyspnea. But if someone had congestive heart failure or um, chronic kidney disease, we would further maybe half the dose and then spread the frequency a little bit larger. Um, thinking through a few things about opioids, we'd wanna make sure we would review the side effects with patients and their families to keep an eye out for. The more common ones are nausea on the first few days of initiating opioids. And generally um, a good medication to prescribe kind of to have as needed would be metoclopramide or Maxaran. Um, definitely constipation, so monitoring the bowels and either starting something um, if you're going to be taking the opioids regularly, we normally recommend starting a laxative regularly to prevent constipation, probably more, more typically Senecot, um, although I'm seeing PEG being used just as often now. And then thinking about, you know, when we would want to use that treatment. So sometimes patients who are dyspneic all the time, we would start a very low dose scheduled around the clock, like every four to six hours, um, whereas some people are just dyspneic on exertion. And so there's not a lot of data to say to start um, with treating dyspnea just on exertion, but um, some patients it is simply on exertion and can be very problematic. And so we do initiate opioids in that, in that, um, in that event. Um, thinking about how quickly you would want your response and so if we're just going to use it on an as needed basis, if it has to kick in quite quickly, oral medications takes about 45 minutes to get effect, whereas subcutaneous medications um, take about 15 to 20 minutes to get effect. And so thinking, OK, do I want to use oral? Should I use subcutaneous? And then if we do know that you're going to be doing something that's going to cause dyspnea, 
maybe thinking about even pre-treating. And so taking it, you know, 15 minutes, if it's going to be subcutaneous, 15 minutes before you bath or shower, um, so that knowing that that's going to precipitate a lot of dyspnea. And so there's a lot of like, kind of nuance or art about prescribing opioids. So thinking through your route, thinking through, do you want to treat before the, the trigger or after? And then also thinking, are you going to do a scheduled around the clock for constant dyspnea or just use it as needed for exertional dyspnea? So to, I guess a word on benzodiazepines as well. Um, uh, so benzodiazepines can be very, very helpful in treating anxiety that's associated with the dyspnea. And generally, I try to describe that to patients and families as saying it's actually very no normal and um, it's inert in us to have anxiety when we're short of breath. We we receive a catecholamine storm, meaning we like our adrenaline um, starts flaring when we can't breathe because our body is trying to give ourselves energy to save us from the potential looming thing that's going to cause our demise. And so there is like a catecholamine or adrenaline storm that creates that sensation of anxiety when you can't breathe. Um, and so if you don't co-manage those things, then um, it can be that the opioids will just not be enough. But hopefully if you're managing the dyspnea adequately, that there isn't a point where the anxiety starts taking over. Um, if it does, then it's important to kind of potentially add in a benzodiazepine in those moments. Benzodiazepines have their side effects as well. Generally, sedation is one of them. And so making sure that you're choosing appropriate dosing, um, falls, cognitive impairment. And so, you know, all things are taken um, with risk and benefit. Most of the time, if we're looking at just using a benzodiazepine for exertional dyspnea or just using it kind of as needed, we want something that's short acting, that acts quickly and potentially comes out of the system quickly. And so the short acting benzo of choice would be midazolam and that's available um, subcutaneously or also can be administered buccally. Um, and it can be administered every hour as needed. That being said, if they're using like multiple doses of midazolam per day, then thinking about longer term strategies of having better coverage of benzodiazepines throughout the day, I wouldn't choose midazolam as my first choice because it is short acting. So coming in and out of the system quite quickly, which would involve multiple doses per day. Um, so then you would want to consider something more long acting like uh, potentially lorazepam that's generally dosed every eight hours um, or clonazepam every 12 hours. That being said, if you're getting to that point, it may be important to involve like a palliative care consultant for like a one-time consult on dose suggestions or potentially the pros and cons of using a benzodiazepine. Um, otherwise, I think that dyspnea can become quite severe in certain patients and um, we tend to use a midazolam CAD pump at that time, where if we are going to be, we know that it's going to be progressive and that we're going to be increasing benzodiazepines over time, that the CAD pump can be helpful. So midazolam is very short acting, but if it's given in a continuous infusion with a CAD pump, then um, it's a very effective tool. Um, I guess just a word on palliative sedation, um, and that's a whole topic in itself, and I'm happy to do one of these uh, sessions. It's a, definitely a one-hour talk, but um, dyspnea is actually a quite common presentation for um, requiring palliative sedation, and so not to um, forget that as a tool if the, the, the prognosis is very close to end of life, um, and at that time, we definitely would recommend involving um, kind of your local resources for palliative care and considering palliative sedation if you think that's um, indicated for your patient. Um, a quick word on some associated symptoms that come along with dyspnea. So um, sometimes patients will have a lot of secretions. And when I mean secretions is like kind of upper respiratory tract secretions. Generally, we would see this towards end of life when people are not able to manage their saliva or they're having some dysphagia with liquids that they're ingesting. Um, sometimes people with COPD can have a lot of um, kind of phlegm, but I would really try to distinguish, uh, like distinguish those as separate. Um, 
And so the secretions that kind of are in the upper respiratory tract, um, often you can use um, non-pharmacologically just repositioning and then the patient will clear their throat and they'll kind of come through the vocal cords and they won't be so audible anymore. Um, so shifting someone on their side then back to their back or on the other side, that sort of thing, sitting up a little bit more. Um, and then our medication of choice to use our anticholinergics. And so uh, glycopyrrolate is a medication available subcutaneously that we normally dose um, like 0 0.4 milligrams every four hours as needed. Uh, that medication does not cross the blood vein barrier. So it doesn't induce as much sedation as scopolamine, um, but scopolamine would be kind of the second line. Um, those medications dry up secretions. So they dry up your mouth as a consequence. And, um, and so just making sure you're doing really good oral care to manage dry mouth if you're initiating those medications. Um, we didn't really put phlegm on this presentation, but phlegm can be something that can be quite problematic with patients and um, can be used, like managed with um, uh, um, long-acting anticholinergic inhalers or um, short-acting anticholinergic inhalers um, if it's coming from a place of COPD. And often sometimes we'll use nebulized saline to help kind of loosen up the phlegm to be able for the patient to cough them up as well. A word about cough. Um, and so sometimes the cough is coming just from dryness of the airway tract if they're on home oxygen already. Um, and so just asking the RT from the oxygen company to reassess and um, add humidified, uh, like a little... Is it normal saline in that? I think it's normal saline or um, or potentially just, um, what's the word of that water? That they use distilled water. water. Distilled water, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so the distilled water, they use this little bottle on the oxygen machines to humidify the oxygen so it's not as dry in their throat and kind of that kind of dry, like hacky, like something's in your throat type of the situation. So that can be very helpful. Same with the nebulized saline, especially if it's phlegm causing the, the cough. Um, dextromethorphan, we added, there, there's not a lot of evidence to support dextromethorphan, but I have seen anecdotally some effect with some patients um, and doesn't have the side effect profile that opioids do. Um, so dextromethorphan can be found in like over-the-counter um, cough syrups and maybe just working with your, it also can be prescribed um, so just working with your local pharmacist to see what they have over the counter can be helpful. And then opioids, the most typical thing you see is like a codeine syrup, um, which can help with cough. Um, but so can other opioids like morphine tablets or hydromorphone tablets. Um, opioids in general are cough suppressant. And so wh whether it's a syrup or a tablet, I don't think it really makes a lot of difference. Some people feel like the syrup is kind of soothing to the throat and could potentially be more uh, placebo effect than anything. Um, and then like last thing would be like a, a nebulized local anesthetic. So like a nebulized lidocaine or things like that. And that can be very pricey and um, I don't think it's covered um, otherwise. So uh, that would be kind of like last line. And so our last slide is a plug for our team. Uh, both Amanda and I are very passionate about uh, the Regional Palliative Consult team. We're uh, a consultation service, so we're not here to take over. We want to support, educate, empower you guys to do your own palliative care. We're here for you to lean on us. We're here for advice 24 hours a day. We don't have to have seen your patient like to have to do a just quick phone call to say like, is this okay? Like. You, you can call any time to get some advice. Um, and it, yeah, we're happy to see patients in the community like recurrently or just as a one-time consult as well. Um, yeah, I also included the pulmonary rehab program through the Ottawa Hospital and um, lunghealth.ca ha has some good resources. And we're happy to take any questions. We leave you with a Cicely Saunders quote. Um, you matter because you are you, you matter to the last moment of your life, and we will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. Hopefully this gave you a few pearls and ideas, but all, most of all, we want to just be here to answer any questions you have about dys dyspnea and difficult cases, potentially.
There's a question from Val in the chat. Uh, to what extent should patients be encouraged to continue using their CPAP or their BiPAP for sleep apnea toward the end of life? That's a good question. You what do you think, it? Jeff? No, I'm okay, passing I can it go. Uh, Yeah, like I... I think encourage is like the, the the best word to say it, Val. Like I think um, a lot of patients that are fed up with using those things and they're just, you know, it's not worth it to me. Um, there, some respirologists will say, well, if they don't want to use their CPAP, just running oxygen overnight um, can be supportive to the patient, but probably will still have fatigue during the day because they'll still be waking up in those like chronic um, recurrent uh, apneic spells. But that decrease in oxygen over time remodels the heart to have um, like a right heart failure type profile and patients can be quite symptomatic from that. And so BiPAP can be super effective. CPAP can be super effective depending on which illnesses they, they have. But um, I think like kind encouragement and, and coming from a place of compassion of knowing that they've probably been tied to these machines for years and they're fed up and they know that, you know, their prognosis potentially could be short. I'm always understanding of trying another strategy. And not being afraid to call the RT to reassess. Like, I think that's really important because they're like, I, I don't pretend to have the expertise they do in all these machines and the settings. And, you know, sometimes it's just reducing the setting to be a little bit less intense and then it's more tolerable to them and then they'll wear it. So maybe it's not perfect, but it's like, you know, not maybe not ideal, but subpar, but it's still good management. And I think one thing we didn't really talk about much in this talk is how patients with a non-cancer diagnosis can live for quite a long time with quite a lot of symptom burden. Um, and so it's really hard to prognosticate. So I've had like really frail, cachectic, PPS 30%. So they're spending most of their time in a bed or a chair patients with COPD on my caseload for four years. And so it becomes very challenging when you're planning their care plan you know they say well i'm dying everyone tells me i'm dying but yet they're still living for three or four years quite sick and so that's where i if they're a cpap wearer that's where i try to ask them are you really really tired in the daytime are you having morning headaches like these are reasons to wear your cpap versus you know maybe they're so fed up it's just not important to them anymore they're willing to put up with a bit of the tiredness just not to wear it but it is hard. These patients, non-cancer diagnoses with COPD or CHF, they can live for a long time quite unwell. And so it, it can be difficult to find the balance. Yeah. And I think the, the best that strategies for these patients is to prevent exacerbations, or if there is an exacerbation, having a, a plan in place for your team that's on the ground, seeing that patient every day to action that quickly. Um, most retirement homes will have very good connections with their MRPs um, and can reach them pretty quickly with, um, to avoid hospitalizations. But um, if there is lag time or if there is days off or not lack of coverage, sometimes having that kind of prednisone antibiotic kind of prescribed and in home just in case, or um, in terms of like a CHF, like a double the Lasix, if weight goes over this, um, that sort of thing. Um, and those strategies can give you time to get in there to assess, to make an action plan so that you avoid that hospitalization, that emergency room department. Are there any other questions out there in regards to like challenging patients you've seen or like logistics and home care and retirement homes in regards to the medications or communication with patients and families regarding dyspnea? I'm going to ask you a question, Dr. Rory. Um, if a client has really poor kidney function and you're not you're not going to go the route of diuretics, is there another way to manage the dyspnea without diuretics? Like I'm looking at your other ideas, like maybe puffers and that kind of thing. Is there anything else that like what, what, how would you manage that? So your patient has congestive heart failure and kidney With, failure and kidney issues. Yeah, yeah. So in those cases, like it's to Pros and cons, pros and cons. Every okay. every conversation I have, every medication I prescribe, 
effect or side effect. And so thinking about your diuretics in a context of chronic kidney disease, it's probably best to favor the lung than the kidney. And when you got like, when you ask internal medicine specialists, they'll say the same. So okay. using those diuretics, use them, even if the kidneys are taxed, um, maybe don't use them at like an insane dose or consider doing blood work. Um, and this is all within goals of care, right? Doing blood work to check your creatinine, your electrolytes after the use of, um, like an increase in your diuretics, maybe trying to do pulse as opposed to always having them on a high dose. But regardless of what strategy you use, whatever diuretics you use, you're going to tax the kidney. Yeah. But that is actually just a consequence of getting down the line of the heart failure. And some patients have chronic kidney disease separate, like a separate diagnosis, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's just chronic kidney disease from being on diuretics for a gazillion years. And yeah. so those strategies are, um, I wouldn't abort diuretics unless it was the patient saying to me, well, I don't want to take them because of my kidney. But even if they did say that, I would come at them with education and saying, then your, your disease is going to be very problematic. And we're going to have to use potentially more opioids, which opioids in the context of chronic kidney disease, you're at high risk of toxicity. Uh, and you'll have to use lower doses, spread them out. And so it's to their best interest to continue di um, diuretics. You may want to consider dropping them off their ACE inhibitor or their ARB, um, you know, keeping um, like maybe using like a, like a beta blocker uh, ongoing, but, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like ARB beta blocker, um, then using also your uh, spironolactone, sorry, I'm trying to think of the class of medication, myelocorticoid. So mm -hmm. those those are all like in keeping, like try to prevent the exacerbation and then using the lowest diuretic amount that you can, but I wouldn't not use it. Okay. And I think sometimes too, we forget to come back to basics. Like we've seen a couple of patients on our team recently with these really swollen limbs and they're on diuretics and we can't, and they're symptomatic. And then when we are talking to them, we find out, well, I'm palliative. So I've been eating a bag of chips every night and I've been drinking tons of fluid. So they haven't been following like the basics of a sodium restriction or a fluid restriction. And so when we get them back to some of these basic pr disease management principles, we're actually able to get some, some control again. Yeah, I'd also add like my, my plug of swollen legs of like people who are just like, oh my gosh, their legs are swollen. We must prescribe them Lasix. And unless it's a context of congestive heart failure, we should be using more compression and leg elevation strategies, looking at medication profiles, like what are we doing to our patients, you know, gabinoids, increased leg swelling, uh, um, amlodipine or calcium channel blockers um, can cause leg swelling. And so you know, we, we all see these patients, they're sitting in their chair all day, their legs are balloons. And then, but they don't really merit diuretics. Cause when you to to pull that fluid out of that leg, you have to like dehydrate the patient's intravascular, um, volume supply to be able to resorb that leg edema. And so thinking through like, okay, is that patient mobilizing? That's a fall risk. And so thinking about using like strategies like to be grip, which is very light compression, or um, I'm a huge fan and potentially home care hates me for this, but of Coban 2, uh, light wrapping, like the nurses wrapping the legs with um, the Coban 2, because that kind of squeezes the fluid back out. And then once your leg is nice and skinny, then you get the compression stockings on. And so, um, you know, it is nursing intensive, but uh, they, they do well. And if you can minimize diuretics in that sense, then hopefully you can preserve kidneys. I was wondering when you're talking about logistics um, and maybe, you know, some of the home care coordinators can speak to this too, is around oxygen therapy. So what are kind of the rules these days about oxygen therapy and oxygen being covered cost-wise um, for, for folks at the end of life, given they could live for four years? <laughs> <laughs> ideally they qualify for it medically um and so that's challenging to do in the home um because it requires an abg um and those cannot be done in the home uh abg is an arterial blood gas 
um, and it has to be done kind of very quickly to the lab. Um, so it can't be drawn in the home. It can't be a VBG uh, with venous blood gas. Um, and then the other uh, ability to qualify medically is um, like a walk test. And so a lot of respirologists have this in their clinic and like they can qualify people for it there. But then once they're homebound to qualify medically, um, often you'll have to advocate for a walk test with your oxygen company. Um, and so most of the time, if I'm initiating palliative oxygen, I'll, I'll start them on a palliative program. Um, and all you have to write is like uh, PRN oxygen for comfort. And there's no like strategy or set, like I'll tell the families, like try to keep the oxygen within this range. Um, but then if they're, they've exhausted that three month coverage, then they would try to do it for medical, medical, um, qualification and they would do a walk test with the RT from that oxygen company in their home um, to hopefully get approved. If they don't get approved, then they have to pay for it out of pocket um, or do without, which like is challenging. So I try to like stretch that time of like need as far back as I can or try to see if they would qualify medically. And I think medically is that you have to, I think it's under 88 um, yeah, I think it's under, I think it's under 88, um, percent with walking. And so if they're dipping below that, then I think that they'll qualify medically. I'd have to look that up to like, just refresh my memory, but, um, or I think if it's under, I want to say 92 at rest or something like that, Amanda, under 90 at rest, maybe, um, I'd have to look that up too. The respiratory therapists that come do the home assessments though are pretty good about trying to exert them enough that they qualify. Yeah. But I have certainly seen patients who just really don't fit the criteria. And so it's important to remember that you, you in order to really get benefit from the oxygen, not the airflow, is you need to be hypoxic, low oxygen saturations, and dyspneic, right? Versus just being high, just being dyspneic without the associated hypoxia, it's probably more the airflow that that is giving you symptomatic benefit. Well, thanks everyone for attending and uh, we hope it was helpful. Are there, um, Val and Carl, are there any sort of evaluations or anything that go out for these or it's just kind of- Carl's informal. popping it in the chat as we speak. <laughs> ah, so, Carl read know, my mind. If folks can <laughs> please take a minute to uh, do the evaluation. We also, like we post the- videos on our YouTube channel and we have people do the evaluation if they want a certificate of participation um, for doing the online or watching the online presentation. So we gather evaluation data in every way we can. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much again, Amanda and Jessica, and thanks to everybody who joined us today.